a nice disruptive startups welcome for uh, Ray and Thomas. Thanks, Vince. G'day, everybody. As Vince touched on, um, a kind of new gig we're running here is a little bit of a crash course in something that goes hand in hand with uh, VC. I uh, won't uh, kind of cut to the party too quickly, but in order to get VC, I'm pretty sure we need monetization, we need cash flowing. Uh, so I'm Thomas Smittle, welcome. My name is Ray, I've got a bit more of a technical background inside gamification, that side of things, but... Um, yeah. yeah, and I'm more commerce-y, so that's a good fit for it. Let's get into it. So how do people make money from apps? We get people coming to App Store all the time, they go, I got a cool idea, it's disruptive, it's different, but how do I make money from it? So we want to touch on just a couple of the ways that we can achieve this. So I won't, I won't go over too many of them, but freemium, we're going to talk about a little bit of advertising, lead generation, what that is, how we can achieve it, transaction systems, subscription, big data, and virtual goods. We'll go through these in a bit more detail, but keep in mind that not all of them will be applicable depending on your idea, but it's usually a combination of one or more that like, will suit your product perfectly. Yeah, before we jump in, um, this sort of content is in the um, Startup Ready workshops that we're doing. That's part of the door prize. So if you do want to see more of this, put your name in for sure and you could win. So free stuff, um, free apps right in the market right now. Everything seems to be free. The pluses to that, you can scale it really quickly. People love free stuff. There's no risk for them in uh, downloading your application. Although the fear of never getting paid is a little bit tricky. Um, you put it out there and to you know, realize that initial investment can be a bit scary. You know, a lot of the time it's going to take a little, a little bit of kind of grind until another monetization model kicks in. Also there's a perception in the market of, of free being less of value. I mean, if, if you look just normal world, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Whereas with apps, there is, there really is. And building off what Tom said there, in terms of it not being exactly a viable business model, but more of a marketing tactic, it's more a case of trying to, a good example is WhatsApp actually. WhatsApp originally started with their first 12 months being completely free. So lots of people would join on, it's a messaging service. And then after that first 12 months, that's when they kicked into monetization. By that stage, users were so invested in terms of having all their contacts in there and having those, that ability to go back and forth that they were more than happy to pay a dollar for a 12-month subscription. And at that stage, I think you had about two or three million users on the app at the time. Yeah, I'll say. It's called deferred monetization, so it's just going in with no strategy whatsoever and then uh, trying to cash in later, um, whether that is by turning on the subscription switch, is what they did, or a lot of people go out there and just say, my monetization model here is to get acquired. I want to get acquired by Facebook or someone. Exactly, and there's plenty of different ways you can go about it. There's the capacity-based system, which is what Dropbox uses. That's using a system where effectively you can just keep increasing it with further in-app purchases or something similar. And there's other ones as well. So time-based is one of the most common ones, your 30-day free trial and that side of things. There's plenty more to go into. And I'll just touch on the fact that it's really not a monetization model per se, because um, you're really not making any money at all. You're giving it away for free. But what it does is it creates a ton of market buzz around your application. It's super easy to get it out. And then one day you do, you do flick on that switch. So. Advertising, this is just the knee-jerk reflex. Everybody goes, well, I'll just slap ads in there. And it can work, it can work really well. So, you know, actually putting in ads from, say, Google service, uh, AdWords, or putting in iAd, which is Apple's service, can be a good way. You know, you can make uh, three cents for about a thousand views of an application. And again, a listing fees, uh, eBay style. So people are paying you to advertise their products for them. Could be a cool model. The the, the downside to this is, you know, you need a whole lot of traction in the market. You need a critical mass to show enough ads to make enough money here. And a lot of the time, the, you know, day one launch, you're not going to be turning over much revenue um, with advertising. Exactly. Tying what Tom said there, it's really about a really big acquisition rate and then the retention in terms of keeping them on for a long period of time. Otherwise, you, they're not going to have their eyes flicking past those ads as you're going to get a very small amount. Also tying into that is the willingness to actually put more ads over your content. Of course, the more you have there, the more revenue you'll be generating, but the further you dig into that, the more you'll annoy your users. So it's really about finding that middle ground. Yeah, a great example of that with me is um, news.com.au. So I read it all the time, it's a good website for news, but what they started doing is putting full screen ads on there. I mean, that's a key. If they, if they wanna grow their revenue and the only way to do it is to eat into the content there and to actually you know, disrupt my user experience. Lead gen, so lead gen is one that is you know, quite prevalent right now. You see a lot of ads on TV for like 
iSelect or compare the Meerkat, that's the good one. Um, so yeah, the idea is you create a lead, right? So you qualify someone, you make sure that they're actually interested and really want something, just like when you get on, say, iSelect, and they, are, they know you're keen on buying insurance because you've put in all your information. They, you're a lead then, and what we do is we sell that lead to someone who wants it, say, RACV. They want that insurance. And it's a good point. Lead generation is actually quite effective for some of the startups who are looking for partnerships. A good example could be something like you're basing a sport injury app or something similar. Then often partnering with, say, an insurance company who specifies in sports injuries, they love having those users come through and getting a lot of that detail. They'll even be filling out when they're getting injured and that side of things. So it's excellent for those sort of partnerships when you're first starting out. It's interesting to see how um, I select do it. I mean, in terms of their business model, they really I mean, they pose themselves as we help you find the best insurance. But in terms of their business, they really couldn't care less which one you click, um, because they sell every single lead, you know, to to varying insurance firms. I think a big thing that we also have to touch on here is is transparency. Um, I'll, I'll bring up an example of one thing that um, I experienced. I was on car sales, looking at cars, and. I got a call from the bank and they said, oh, hi, Tom, we've pre-approved you for a line of credit and we'd like to get you into your dream car today. I said, wow, well, how did you guys get that information? They danced around it a little bit. Um, they finally said, oh, we bought it from a third-party data vendor. I, said, oh, I know what this is. Went and looked on car sales, buried in like page 600 or something was, you know, we might sell your browsing habits to third parties. So they'd put my browsing out to tender and Commonwealth Bank said, yeah, he's ours. System credit checked me and said, yeah, let's try and sell him a car. And did you end up actually taking a loan from that specific bank? No, I didn't because I was a bit creeped out. I think that's where the transparency comes in. Exactly. It's more of a case of if you come up front and actually explain what you're using the data for and how, then often many users will be much more appreciative They'd, rather than having to dig through terms and conditions which scares them. You really need to find a specific market for it too. You, know, you can't just sell insurance to anyone. It's quite specialised exactly who's going to be buying those leads. So transaction fees. I mean, the king of transaction fees right now is PayPal. I mean, they're really smashing it. The idea is you transfer money or something, and we skim a little bit off the top. So e-commerce uh, and marketplace platforms doing it really well. Look, the downside to it is they take a little bit out of everyone. Um, they amass them all together, and it turns into quite big profit. I think uh, like PayPal do like 2 to 3% for merchants. Exactly, but to take that small amount as well, you need a very high user acquisition rate and then again retention. So a lot of them spending money and over a large period of time. Tying into that as well is you also need that, like the negative chargeback scenario is a bit of a pain for a lot of startups. What that ties into is when you take a little bit off the top, you're the person in the middle. So when someone does a chargeback and asks for their money back, the bank sees you as that last person, meaning that you need to have, say, a million or $500,000 in the bank so they can cover it. That's why often it's not the first choice, but it does play into it. Yeah, it's a bit scary for startups. Sometimes they don't want to. They want to be a bank. They don't want to have that mu much money locked away. So it can be a little bit of an impediment. I think one one thing with with transaction fees and services that we'll see coming into the market probably next year is Apple Pay. I mean, you know, NFC, near field communication, like, uh, PayWave. I think Visa call it. Um, that'll be really cool. I think we'll start to see tons of apps coming out, really disrupting the payment market in that. You see all these Apple fans talking about how revolutionary it is when Android's had it for the last two or three years. No, it's, it's very, very revolutionary. We go on to the next one, so subscription. Um, a great one. Being from a commerce background, I love subscription models. You know when money's coming in. That's the beauty of it. If you run with, say, advertising, you can't readily predict when cash is going to come in. Over time, you might, but when you start up, it's really tricky to do it. I mean, likewise, with having, you know, uh, even a paid app, you know, people are going to be downloading it, but it's hard to see uh, a cycle or something like that. It's, it's tricky to predict, and especially if you've taken, you know, venture capital money or other, you know, angel investor money. They're really going to want to see traction, and it's, it's tricky to prove it sometimes. So it is. It's awesome because it's so predictable. And the key example that, you know, I love to give is Spotify. They do it so well, and so many of their users pay for their premium service. I know we do. Exactly. And like, I'm a bit of a technical background, I was saying before, and it's even great for us in the sense that it's good to have that constant revenue coming through, mainly just because then you can predict and plan your updates. Most users will actually base a lot of their impact if they keep using an app based on how often you're doing updates, if you're listening to feedback, all that side of things too. So you really need a lot of that um, brand trust as well because it shows that like you've got a lot of consideration and you're going to use their details for a lot of right things because people don't like having their details saved and money automatically coming out of their account. They'd rather pay up front. Give us their data with a Facebook login or something else like that. So you really need to establish a lot of brand trust and have a very valuable product so that they, they can actually see the tangible of what they're getting back.
So big data, everybody kind of cringes, sort of buzzword right now. But in terms of data sales, it is, you know, it's really in, I guess. You know, we need really, really high acquisition rates. So you need tons and tons of people. I, I use the term kind of critical mass and the ball's rolling down the hill so quickly. In order to make predictions that you can sell from big data, you just need tons of users. And a lot of the time, you need them to stick over time. So they need to be there for, you know, a time series so we can look at, you know, growth, something like that. Exactly, you need to be able to compare that to when they originally started. But as you can see from the graph on the left there as well, in 2018 they predicted to be a $50 billion market. It's quite huge. And as from the examples over on the left further, you can see one of the major players in is Facebook, LinkedIn, Google Plus. That's where a lot of their revenue and like most of the time their uh, public offering value comes from. And even if they haven't sold it, it's worth so much to a lot of companies. Yeah, 50, 50 billion is a huge number. I mean, I draw back to Facebook. They do it really well. They don't actively sell data, but what they do sell is the information to be able to target consumers so that you can get to the right people. Um, the buzz one again, virtual goods, uh, tons of games. I mean, it's, it's a great way to do it. So it's all about creating something, be it a game, be it a gift, some sort of content, and actually selling them that digitally. Um, we, we call it the money printer sometimes. Uh, it, the beauty of it technically, um, and I use Candy Crush as the example here. Candy Crush, really good, everyone knows it. It's a terrible thing, but super addictive for lots of people. And whether they make you that one lollipop that you, know, you use in the game, or they make 100 million lollipops, it's really no different in terms of business cost. When Tom touches on the uh, money printer side of things there, we shouldn't get too excited because one of the negatives of it is it is incredibly difficult to balance. You'll see this in many games. Probably one of the famous examples recently was one of EA's releases called Dungeons. It was so heavily monetized that it was critically acclaimed across the board and so unbalanced that no one went back to it and since then basically refused to play any further EA games. So the balancing side is quite difficult and that's where you have to tie in that analytics and the data and constantly coming back to that and checking where people are using the money, where they're seeing important and what the rates are and whereabouts. The plus side of having them buy into the game like that is this huge level of investment. In their head, they're like, wow, I've already spent like 60 bucks on this game. You know, it's too late for me to jump to another game or like another platform. Which one is the best fit for you guys? I really think it's all about context. You know, not everybody is going to be able to do big data on their app or service. Not everyone's going to be able to do virtual goods. So it's all about, you know, what your application or what your web service is about. Exactly. Like, it really comes down to a combination of all of them, I think. There's some great examples where LinkedIn, for example, uses almost all of them. Some examples off the top of the head is the in-app, um, the mail purchase, where you pay a certain amount to send mail, virtual goods. It also brings in the subscription side of things, having you sign up for that premium membership. Also ties into the advertisement side of things, bringing that through it as well. So usually it is a combination of many, just so that way if you have users who aren't paying up front, there is another solution. Yeah, it, it's good when you run a hybrid like that. Like in terms of, of uh, business planning, you really don't want to have all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. So having a hybrid of, say, advertising and a subscription service can be really good because if people stop you know, buying the subscription, they're likely to still watch the advertising so your business continues to function. So that's about it from us. We'll uh, jump into the main presentation, but we want you to tweet at us if you have any questions or kind of hunt us down in the audience. Thanks, Vince. It's been great. Thanks.